Hey, everybody. Happy Friday. I hope you've had a great week. Uh, good morning to you from Puerto Rico. Uh, I'm Dan Lamott, CEO and co-founder of Threshold.World, and I'm excited to be your host for this Scaling Impact webcast. Uh, today, we're hoping to have a highly interactive conversation, perhaps even a debate or two, uh, both with the guests as well as those of you uh, who are sharing your time with us on this Friday. So please, Tell us where you're joining in from the chat. Uh, share your questions and comments throughout the webcast. Challenge us uh, on anything you hear if you see fit, and let's do our best to make this time a showcase of human interoperability. So here's how the rest of the webcast is going to roll. I'll get us started with some context around our theme for the day. Uh, then you'll meet each of our guests. There'll be a common data model aligned solution showcase. Uh, then a news desk update from our Redmond desk, followed by a special guest appearance and discussion with Eric Arnold from Microsoft, another news desk update from the CDM community, and finally, an open panel discussion with Marty Webb from TechSoup and Suzanne Holmberg from TIST to close us out. There's a lot to get to in 45 minutes or so, uh, so let's get rolling. Uh, but I do feel that as we get started, uh, compelled to acknowledge the loss of so many lives over the past year uh, due to COVID, uh, as well as the gratitude I feel for the scientific and medical workers on the front lines, sacrificing so much to keep us as safe as possible in the face of tremendous adversity. Uh, and second, to recognize that March is Women's History Month and this coming Monday is International Women's Day. It's an important time to acknowledge the challenge of the work that remains and the critical role each of us must play. On a personal note, I remain hopeful when I walk alongside my daughter, Sophia, my co-founder, Lena, my three sisters, my mom, and all the female thresholders. So thank you to each of you for your voice and your inspiration. Now, our topic today is scaling impact, how common data model aligned program design will power the future of nonprofit impact. It's a mouthful, but it's a bold statement. And that's the sector defined common data model for nonprofits just shy of two and a half years old will power the future of impact. Our goal is to make a case uh, for this in this session as a call to action for the sector. And I'm looking forward to hearing what you in the audience and today's guests think about this. So thank you to everybody in the audience for taking the time to be part of the discussion today. If you're a member of a nonprofit program team or work in support of monitoring, evaluation, research and learning, this webcast is for you. If you work for a technology or data company supporting nonprofits, this event is also for you. Uh, and welcome to you all. Uh, I'd also like to offer a very special thanks to the three people who I admire uh, for being, agreeing to be here today. Each of these extraordinary humans has a unique role to play in nonprofit program success that motivates me to continue aligning thresholds investments to the CDM for nonprofits. So I'd like the, each of them to introduce themselves. And uh, I think I'll start off with Suzanne. So Suzanne, would you be able to welcome and introduce yourself? Yes, thank you so much for that kind introduction, Dan. My name is Suzanne Holmberg. I work for TIST, which stands for the International Small Group and Tree Planting Program, which is also a mouthful. My background is in data and analytics, working for traditionally manufacturing companies, and I now have the opportunity to work for TIST. And as a program manager, I help I serve farmers, subsistence farmers across the entire world um, as they plant trees that impacts not only their livelihoods, but their communities. And uh, in honor of Women's History Month, you know, one of the things that I'm most passionate about in the work that we do is that we strive for gender equality and 50% of our leadership in all of our operating countries are women. Thank you very much for being here, Suzanne. It's awesome to get to spend a little bit of time with you. And, and Marnie, would you be able to jump in next? A absolutely. Hi, I'm Marnie Webb and I work for TechSoup. TechSoup is a nonprofit organization that works with civil society and countries all around the world to help build their capacity to be able to better use technology to achieve their own goals. And we do that by partnering with other capacity building organizations so that we're able to provide services and support um, 
sort of with a strong degree of local context, not just language, right, but what it's actually like to use technology in those countries. Um, I'm also lucky to be able to work with communities on the ground to build solutions to help them meet some of the most pressing issues. And uh, I'm super happy to be in this conversation today. Awesome. Th thanks, Marty. So much more to talk about. We'll, we'll definitely get to that during the course of the discussion today. Uh, and uh, last but certainly not least, uh, my good friend, Eric Arnold. Eric, would you say hi to everybody, please? Hi, everybody. Um, so my name is Eric Arnold, and I am lucky enough to be the global CTO for the team at uh, Microsoft called Tech for Social Impact. Tech for Social Impact um, is the organization um, within Microsoft Corporation that is focused on the nonprofit sector. We work with over 200,000 nonprofits uh, globally. Um, Microsoft is quietly one of the largest corporate philanthropies out there. We donate over $2 billion in software cash and services every year to over 240,000 nonprofits all around the world. Um, in my role in Tech for Social Impact, I lead um, software engineering. So the, the uh, product strategy and software that we have that we create for nonprofits for United Nations as well as a few of our philanthropy programs, our online software donation programs and all the capacity building that goes around it, the digital enablement, the skilling, the certifications. We don't just think about the, the bits and toss bits over the wall. We also think about how we can help nonprofits be successful adopting technology, incorporating technology into mission, into operations. My background, um, I have over 25 years in uh, technology, primarily in software engineering and uh, software engineering leadership roles, but spent the last 10 years prior to, to Microsoft in the nonprofit sector, working in global health um, at PATH as their international CIO. So have uh, done a lot of work implementing uh, digital technology into an international organization um, and uh, making uh, technology work where electricity doesn't. And that's where we got to meet each other, right, Eric? Way back yeah. when. Seems like the, it was so long ago that the world was a little bit black and white. In those yeah, days. a couple of lifetimes ago, it seems. Yeah, sure was. Well, uh, thank you, Suzanne, Marnie, and Eric for agreeing to be part of this webcast today and for giving us a chance to, to talk a little bit about this concept of scaling impact in the context of a common data model. Um, which begs the question, uh, what is a common data model? Uh, I think it makes a lot of sense to start there. So we're going to spend just a minute or two talking about what a common data model is and working our way towards uh, the rest of the, the, the segment. So a common data model is a shared data language for business and analytical applications to use. Uh, it's a set of standardized, extensible tables, fields, metadata, and relationships. Uh, but it's not a finished app or a user-facing product that's ready to go out of the box. Uh, it's a design, right? It's this common language that allows these applications to communicate with each other. And the output of leveraging CDMs is that data and its meaning are shared across applications, which makes it simpler to create them, simpler to aggregate data uh, and analytics and drive decision support. Uh, and the outcome of that effort is that time and expense are saved for the users and the organizations that adopt CDMs, uh, interoperability of systems, sustainability of tech investment, and user morale and decision support are, are improved, which is a really compelling use case from, from where I sit. Um, which then also leads us to, you know, if that's a common data model, what is the common data model for nonprofits? The common data model for nonprofits is a shared data language for nonprofit business and analytical applications to use. Here's a picture of it down in the right-hand corner. Uh, which shows you the over 90 standardized, extensible designs for tables, fields, metadata, and relationships specific to the full life cycle of nonprofit operations and engagement. Eric's going to show you a lot more about this concept later today, uh, which brings it home to this idea for today's webcast, which is why does it matter at all if a program delivery solution is aligned to the common data model for nonprofits. Uh, and what is a common data model aligned program design solution? It is a program delivery solution based on or connected to the common data model for nonprofits. And the core components of that design are listed here on the right hand side. It includes things like the highest level organizational priorities, strategies, and goals 
uh, the units of work, uh, like programs, projects, and activities, budgets, because it's so important to understand uh, where the funds are coming from and where they're going to, uh, something called a result, which is a container that represents the changes in context, including outcomes, outputs, and impacts, indicators to describe what's going to be measured as evidence of the result of the change in context, indicator values that are point in time and point in location, qualitative and quantitative measurements themselves. And finally, and probably most importantly, this association between all of that construct and the participants who, who are engaged in this capacity building and uh, improvement of agency within the world. So when we look at a common data model and then we understand what a common data model for nonprofits is, hopefully this provides a reasonable base for how solutions can be and in our opinion ought to be aligned to the common data model for nonprofits. So as will be the case with all of these webcasts, the next thing on the agenda is going to be a solution showcase. Today we're actually going to show you something that we've been working on at Threshold.World but in the future, we're going to be uh, bringing in guests from other organizations to demonstrate the work that they've been doing in the marketplace. Uh, so if you have any recommendations or if you personally or your team would like to be in this next segment for the solution showcase for next webcast, please feel free to reach out to us or post in the comments uh, because we want to make sure this is a great space to be able to show off all those different solutions. So to get started with that, what I'm going to do is we're going to give you a walkthrough of this solution that is aligned to the common data model for nonprofits called B.World. And B.World is a program design and storytelling application uh, for nonprofit program teams. It allows program teams to uh, go from strategy to story by bringing together the core components of the work that they do every day, which include things like program design, project management, data tracking, and importantly, the communication that goes along with all of the great work that they do. So let's go ahead and jump into the application itself and take a look. Here we go. Great. Get my screen back up. Sorry about that, folks. Here we go. So B.World is a true SaaS application uh, from top to bottom. It all happens to run in Microsoft technologies. But again, every component of the application is directly aligned to the common data model for nonprofits and the program design capabilities that we looked at in the other parts of the application or in, in, in the slide that we just saw before. The way you get to B.World is through a browser. Uh, I'm sure that's not a shocker to anybody. Uh, and it's a project-based system. So when you enter the application, you see cards that are related to all of those delivery frameworks or activities that your organization might be engaged in. If you want to see things that are related to health or to water, you can search based on those. Uh, and ultimately, you have the ability to come in and really easily create new projects and programs with embedded guidance all the way throughout the application to try to make this type of application really accessible to organizations across the spectrum from large to small. To take a quick look at a, an example project, this is uh, from one of our uh, team members, Alex Robinson, who was part of a literacy project uh, in Ghana uh, and has uh, a number of colleagues that were actually engaged in, uh, in attempting to uh, find causal pathways for improving literacy uh, within the country. So the project itself has an overview with dates and locations. You can define things like the challenge statement, what your proposed solution is to try to improve literacy. And you can also include all of the stakeholders that you engage with, with kind of iPhone, simple uh, details about those uh, individuals, organizations. And if you're focused on environmental cause, you might see things down here at the bottom, uh, something like a grove of trees, like in Suzanne's case with TIST, for example. Uh, to define the strategy piece in that part of the, the project process that's uh, at the beginning with ideation and or in the concept of program adaptation, Beat World includes this ability to actually create uh, in a whiteboard your uh, results framework uh, and or your theory of change and in the near future multiple versions of these. 
So if I zoom in, you can actually see that in this case, you know, our ultimate goal is to improve early grade literacy. And there's a number of objectives that lead to that, like ensuring primary school teachers deliver evidence-based literacy pedagogy. Um, there's community engagement through family support, and there's also expanding reading opportunities through reading clubs. And each of those has a one or multiple activities that lead to those objectives, and of course, the ability to track indicators. One thing you might notice on the right-hand side is this, uh, as you build this, it actually helps you develop your logic model or log frame for you. And if you were to click the button at the bottom of the screen, it actually would go create the full log frame for you. I've already done that in the interest of time, but we'll jump over and take a quick look on the log frame to see how this comes together. Inside of the log frame, you can see all the detail around your goals, objectives, activities, and indicators. You can create new indicators that are aligned to standards like the sustainable development goals, if you like and you're able to come into each of those indicators and track all the way down to the real data details, uh, including things like tracking the data collection methodology, the frequency, percentages, and a high, uh, high differential model around dimensions and disaggregates, so you can really get to a specific level of detail around your program delivery. Beat Our World also includes things like tasks, uh, for the micro work management within the program and you can come in and create tasks and notify team members and drag that work around the screen. Uh, just like the common data model for nonprofits, it includes the budget capability so that you can see, for example, you know, where are the funds coming from and going to. In this case, we've just got some samples around the teacher fees uh, that are included for training. And then last but not least, on the storytelling side, uh, one of the challenges that we learned from a lot of the program teams that we spoke with was that you know they have these jobs because they love the work they're passionate about engaging with participants in this case it might be teachers uh, and they have a real challenge in being able to share the incremental results of that work as well as the overall programmatic output outcome and impact with the broader world whether that's for learning or for informing donors and funders etc so Beat Out World has this ability to come in and create a story uh, according to one of to five different models where the user actually is guided through the process of putting together narrative, data, and images which provide you know, the most memorable construct for storytelling. Here's a quick view of one that we created just for demonstration purposes where I can actually see you know, a big banner across the top, incorporation of images and maps, the narrative that comes along with the storytelling itself, um, you know, data tables that are imported like these results to date, and so on and so forth. And then the users of Beat Out World actually have the ability, uh, once they've gained consent, to publish that story. And Beat Out World provides the ability to copy that link, paste that into any other social network or online feed, and then be able to produce those results in a really great format for people to be able to consume in whatever the context might be. So that's a quick run through of a CDM aligned solution. Uh, hopefully you got a flavor of how the logic model and the strategy definition within this tool set allows for interoperability with any other system that an organization might use, uh, whether it's a Microsoft developed technology from an organization like Salesforce, Neon CRM, Plux, or any others that might be aligned to the common data model for nonprofits. So I think we might have a question from the audience. And Suzanne, we've got a question for you, which is related to, uh, given that you and the team at TIST have been such great partners in helping us test the hypothesis that we brought into Beat Out World in the initial phases, uh, realizing that we had so much of it wrong and needed to continue to tune the application, and obviously there's a long way to go. Uh, but the question is, it'd be great to understand, you know, how, how has this capability and the alignment around, you know, the common data model for nonprofits and this idea of outcomes, outputs, and impacts, and baseline actual and targets helped TIS perhaps think about the way that you engage with your constituents and, and get the work done? Sure, thank you for that question. I um, When we first heard about B.World, and I, I can imagine it's been over six months at this point, 
we thought, great, we are going to track everything. TIS does so many great things with farmers. We do conservation farming training. We do HIV AIDS training. We plant trees. Let's go track everything that we do. And working with B.World and especially the, the whiteboard function that was mentioned made us take a step back and say, what's actually important and what do we want to measure and what story do we want to tell? And so working on our theory of change through the whiteboard, we started to look at what are the key impacts that we want to claim at TIST and working backwards from that, what are the activities that we're doing today? What are the outputs of those activities and what are the behavioral change that makes that impact level change that we want to see at TIST and tell that story? And so it's really allowed us to focus in on what's important and tell a better story ultimately, which Dan so aptly uh, called out that a lot of us in this world aren't the best storytellers. Uh, you know, we want to work with the participants and on the program. And so it's much needed help from our end. That's awesome. So then where do you think the this technology aside, right? Because the technology should be the smallest piece of this. It's really about taking the opportunity to think about the work and uh, improve efficacy um, and uh, really engage participants, which is why we're all here in the first place. You know, how, do you do you see any future for the participants to be able to leverage capabilities like this for their own storytelling? Absolutely. Uh, our first goal, once we you know work out all of the ins and outs of the tool, is to get it in the hands of our in-country teams. We want them to be able to manage their programs and tell their own story. So that's critical to the way TIST works. Well, thanks, Suzanne. We, we have a lot to do in the product to earn the right to be part of that expansion with you all. We'll continue to do our best to, to get there with you and the, the team at TIST. So th thank you for your partnership, and we'll look forward to chatting more a little bit in a little while. So we're going to jump to the next segment, which is uh, cut in from our good friend, Aaron McHugh, say, the Global Director of Product Development at Microsoft Tech for Social Impact. Erin's been stewarding the development of nonprofit-focused tech innovation for years. She's a friend. She's somebody I look up to. She's blazing a new trail, driving Microsoft's solution strategy around the common data model, as Eric will tell you later, as the first best customer. Uh, and Erin's coming to us from the Redmond desk to share the latest news and upcoming highlights from Microsoft Tech for Social Impact. So Erin, over to you. Hi, I'm Erin McHugh Safe from the Microsoft Tech for Social Impact team reporting on all the Microsoft nonprofit product news you need to know in about 60 seconds or less, or a little bit more. So February went out like a lion and March rolled in like a lion as Satya and Alyssa Taylor announced Microsoft Cloud for Nonprofit on February 24th. We hope you caught a glimpse of our Ignite deep dive on Microsoft Cloud for Nonprofit this week. If not, never fear. Take advantage of your next opportunity to deep dive and see the latest features during our March 30th Tech for Social Impact webinar. Follow the link on your screen to register. Speaking of fundraising and engagement, if you're a new customer, welcome. We're currently serving nonprofits in over 27 countries worldwide. We are hard at work at our next release, so expect lots of goodness coming in the areas of donation management, LinkedIn integration, Uber constituent profiles, and proactive data enrichment. We also want to make sure that you're aware of our five free seats of Dynamics 365 sales enterprise to supercharge your way into fundraising and engagement. We also offer 10 free users on our platform to leverage all of our nonprofit apps. I also want to give a big shout out and kudos to the Soapbox Engage partner team for breaking new ground and integrating their donation pages with fundraising and engagement, delighting nonprofits everywhere. Soapbox, Threshold.World, and dozens of other partners are now collaborating as part of the nonprofit Common Data Model community. You should join them today. For those of you leveraging one of our 10 nonprofit accelerator apps, be sure to check out our December 2020 assessment management, volunteer management, and frontline humanitarian logistics enhancements that come as part of version 3.0. I also hope you've had a chance to check out an amazing story this week that hit your local news in 60 markets across the country. It highlights the incredible work of Team Rubicon and their frontline volunteer efforts to operationalize vaccine distribution around the U.S. They are also leveraging Microsoft Cloud for Nonprofit to do this. 
And speaking of impressive, we are now partnering with over 600 nonprofits who are participating in our Tech Acceleration for Black and African American Communities program. If you lead or work for a nonprofit organization that would like to get involved, please reach out to us today. And finally, in the midst of all this news, we have a big responsibility to help our nonprofit community get skilled on how to use the technology at their fingertips. Check out our training courses via the Digital Skills Center for Nonprofits. Through the end of March, you can also earn a free exam voucher by completing a learning path as part of the Ignite conference. That's it for me this month. I'm Erin, and I look forward to giving you an update next time. Awesome. Thank you, Aaron, for being here today. Aaron's going to be reporting from the Redmond desk and all of the future webcasts. So look forward to hearing more from Aaron every time we have an opportunity to speak with you. So uh, let's take a moment to try to get our head around all the full extent of what Microsoft's enterprise could look like focusing on serving nonprofits. Uh, this is why I'm so excited to turn it over today to our featured guest and my good friend, Eric Arnold, the global CTO of Tech for Social Impact. Eric, uh, I look up to you. I appreciate your friendship and your guidance and your uh, relentlessness in attempting to get both the Microsoft Enterprise and the rest of us around the world uh, incorporated into this movement around the CDM. So thank you for being here and the floor is yours. Yeah, right, right back at you, Dan. We couldn't have done it without you and the Threshold team. Um, so I work at Microsoft, so I can't speak uh, without slides. So I'm going to bring some slides up um, and go through these, but but hopefully get a little bit of a, a dialogue going um, but between the two of us. So um, me, you know who I am. Um, where did we start this journey? And so back in 2017, when we started Tech for Social Impact, one of the first things we recognized and, and knew we needed to do is, you know, the nonprofit sector is very, very wide. Um, it is essentially a tax code. And inside that tax code, there are many different types of organizations. A child sponsorship organization, from a mission perspective, operates and does things very differently than, say, a conservation organization. But at its core, there are common uh, scenarios and capabilities that most nonprofits share around constituents and fundraising and using constituents very deliberately there. An individual could play multiple roles within an organization. They could be a donor, a volunteer, a board member, and even sometimes a, a beneficiary. And so having a, a single individual and an easy way to track all of those different roles was, was a core concept in how we thought about this. Program delivery, uh, the delivery of mission and mission-based services. Um, you know whether that is to a, a, a person, a puppy, or a beach, um, most nonprofits deliver services in the course of their mission. And this is where this whole thing started. We wanted that, that mission component, that program delivery component at the core of, of the common data model. And, and I think Dan and I together, when we started this nonsense, we're, we're most excited about that. Um, ops and, and financials. Um, at the end of the day, like it or not, um, nonprofits also have to run as businesses and be good stewards of donor funds. And um, that means that, you know, in tracking from a program perspective, the grants and all the different kinds of grants that come in, whether they're individual donations, gift in kind, recurring giving, corporate grants, um, uh, major grants from, from uh, private philanthropies or, or institutional donors, um, all of those have to flow into a system. The designations have to happen across the different programs. And in the financial system, you have to book those transactions and, and uh, uh, show compliance. And then finally, insights and impact. Um, Threshold uh, has done a great job in taking this area and moving forward with it around B.World, but this is all about how you measure the impact of, of the programs themselves. So to create this map um, that, that tries to articulate where is the uniqueness in the nonprofit sector and what is the common denominator across most nonprofit organizations, we started with the NGO reference model, a, a body of work done primarily by a group of NetHope members that sought to um, describe the, the sector. And in that way, you know, we, we don't pretend at Microsoft that we know how nonprofits operate. We know that um, traditionally that this has been an underserved community. And what can we do to bring that community together, to bring a 
cross-sector group of individuals together that can help us understand what the um, uh, what the best practices are in nonprofit. And so we formed a, a group consisting of nonprofits, large and small, um, private foundations, and institutional donors together with uh, tech sector partners that have been working in the nonprofit space, folks like Dan, to help us then take um, this model and start to steward the common data model for nonprofit. And from the very beginning, the intent of this was to uh, represent in entities and attributes and relationships um, those best practices for the nonprofit sector and have that be a platform agnostic ERD that anybody can use that can serve as a Rosetta Stone across different technology applications, but also be a place where tech sector partners can start to reflect those best practices then in software, take some of the cost out of the equation for um, uh, organizations that want to innovate in, in the nonprofit sector and for nonprofits, rest assured that um, this representation reflects those best practices. And as uh, passionate as I am and, and as uh, sexy as I think it is to, to talk about data models on stage, um, it really doesn't come to life until you put software on top of it. And so what um, the first step there was something that we called the nonprofit accelerator. So if you think about the common data model as that platform agnostic representation of best practices, now that here's where Microsoft starts to come in as a customer of that data model. And the first representation of that was the nonprofit accelerator. You heard Aaron talk about that. We've got 10 sample applications that are out there today. Um, these aren't finished turnkey applications. These are more um, shows the power of the common data model as represented in software for some key workflows. And the idea here is that, you know, the um, as as anybody works, you know, you don't think about using Salesforce or Dynamics or Razor's Edge or Power Platform or Word or Excel, like those are applications. How those applications come together to solve for scenarios, to solve for workflows, that's the magic. And so the common data model and the interoperability that it introduces is critically important. And so as we start to layer software on top of it, we want to reflect then that interoperability and that utilization of the model to encourage um, innovation and encourage the aggregation of data. So we break down data silos that have traditionally existed between programs and, and different operational areas. From there, um, last year, uh, we published the first first party application uh, on top of the common data model. This is a, a Microsoft application that we did in partnership with Mission CRM, um, a technology ISV serving nonprofits based out of Toronto, Canada. And this is focused on constituents and fundraising, um, all the different things you need to do to manage your uh, base of donors, work with those donors uh, to drive fundraising, to uh, uh, manage the stewardship of funds to allocate those in, into program budgets and um, then uh, show the responsibility and the stewardship back to your donors um, in, in the uh, donor reporting um, and uh, transaction processing. From there, last week, um, as Aaron mentioned, we announced um, the Microsoft Cloud for Nonprofit. So fundraising and engagement, that's the first application that is part of now a cloud strategy for Microsoft where we look across LinkedIn, uh, all of our productivity applications that exist in office and modern work, all of the business applications that exist in Dynamics and in Power Platform, and all of the advanced analytics that exist in Azure. And now we're building a suite of modular applications left to right that start to really bring to life this value map and bring to life the common data model on Microsoft technology, again, with interoperability in mind. So as we think about what the future looks like and what the vision is for Microsoft Cloud for nonprofits, starting at 12 o'clock here um, with that fundraising and engagement application as the first piece of the Microsoft Cloud for nonprofit puzzle, we start to focus on knowing donors and knowing supporters, driving that constituent engagement, that constituent management, um, and driving fundraising, um, all the different kinds of fundraising and the fund accounting that goes along with it that fuel programs then into all of the complex staffing models that, that many nonprofits work with, um, particularly with volunteers, how you manage volunteers from a headquarters perspective and help onboard them, make sure they've got the right training and certifications to work in the areas you need them to work, how you exit them gracefully, um, and how you um, help them engage and, and connect with, with mission going forward. From a volunteer perspective, how the volunteers engage with your organization, how can they 
um, understand what opportunities exist and see around them um, who else is volunteering and, and start to form some um, volunteer communities and start to, to fuel um, that and uh, fuel the mission through increased volunteerism. Then getting into program delivery, this is you know square towards the heart of uh, where the, the common data model started. This is all around great program design, great analytics, great impact measurement. Uh, B.World World's a great example of an application there. Um, unified data, this is now starting to use a piece of technology in Microsoft called Dataverse, where we bring all the data together across all the different Microsoft applications through Dataverse. So you've got a single point of entry into Microsoft through the CDM and can now move the data seamlessly between, uh, you know, between teams and modern work applications, between Dynamics and Power Platform and in Azure. Um, so you start to break down those silos and start to get more access to insights, insights to operations to drive efficiency, insights into program to drive program efficacy. All of that then um, completing the circle feeds into constituent analytics and personalized engagement, understanding donor propensity, lifetime donor value, um, and how you can understand your donors and uh, who your, your donors influence um, through some of the LinkedIn integration, completing the circle then to constituent management. We um, do this as part of an overall Microsoft strategy where we are um, committing more and more to different industry verticals. And with the announcement last week, we're signaling that nonprofit is a priority industry for Microsoft, one of a very few priority industries for Microsoft. We um, have published uh, industry clouds for healthcare, for retail, for financial services, um, and uh, for uh, now nonprofit. It is an integrated experience across all of our different Microsoft properties, as I said, through Dataverse and through all of the integrations. And so we do that for you. You don't have to build um, that yourself. That comes along with the Microsoft Cloud. It's also modular. You don't have to pick up all the different applications and different pieces that I'm talking about. We, you know, we can meet you where you are. So where you know, if you want to use uh, uh, Power Apps for managing volunteers, great, use a couple power apps for managing your volunteers. If that grows into now how you want to extend that into CRM and manage those volunteers as constituents, you can pick up fundraising and engagement. You can have teams as your pane of glass. You can have the LinkedIn sales navigator integration. So it is all there ready for you and you can pick up the different pieces and, and integrate those pieces into your workflow, recognizing that it's a multi-platform world and organizations use multiple applications. We don't force the whole Microsoft platform on you. You can use and the, the different components as it makes sense for your organization. And then finally, and most importantly, it is focused squarely on nonprofit and we are listening hard to nonprofit organizations, making sure that we understand the workflows, that we understand those best practices, and that they reflect how nonprofits work and how mission is delivered and want to deliver the solutions that really light that up and take noise out of the system. Um, the fundraising and engagement piece, just in the interest of time, I won't spend too much time here. I already talked about how it helps you manage constituents, the opportunity management, donations, recurring gifts. Um, it is a, a you know, fully featured CRM and, and fundraising solution uh, designed specifically for the sector. And instead, I'll talk about how important it is to have partnerships like you're hearing about in the context of this webcast. We can't do this alone as Microsoft, and Microsoft has always been a partner-led company. And so with these investments into um, nonprofit specifically, nonprofit has been traditionally underserved. And so with Microsoft, looking at that common denominator as we've defined it in that value map and with the common data model, now we can build solutions as Microsoft to that common level that then partners can extend and drive increased innovation for the nonprofit sector, more turnkey solutions, deeper down into workflows. Health and Human Services is a great example. Health and Human Services is enormously complex. These are where some of the smallest nonprofit organizations exist. And the solutions that exist for, for Health and Human Services are really varied um, from you know, mental health services and homelessness. It is um, uh, sometimes challenging to, to find you know, easy to use turnkey solutions in those areas. And we've got now a partner community that's really engaging with us to take the investments that Microsoft is making and make it possible to build into some of that white space. So now we have over 50 partners um, that are working with us that are adopting the common data model, that are adopting the, the Microsoft Cloud for nonprofit and uh, extending solutions on top of them. 
Um, to learn more, a few links here, um, aka.ms Microsoft Cloud for Nonprofit, um, aka.ms Microsoft Cloud for Nonprofit webinar for the March 30th webinar that Aaron mentioned. Um, and then we've got some specific information around fundraising and engagement, and you can even go out today, it's available today, um, and, and pick it up off test drive. One important thing to mention here, everything I talked about, all of these sector investments and the purpose-built technology that Microsoft creates, we don't charge a premium for that. We have standard nonprofit discounts across all of our different core product sets and the code and products that, that we deliver um, into the sector as nonprofit, there's not an additional charge for those. So picking up fundraising and engagement and, and test driving it today um, gives you an easy way uh, to learn about the application. And then we offer the, the free licenses if you wanna pick it up and, and think about incorporating it into your organization. Um, I blog uh, regularly about this and post regularly about this on LinkedIn. So if you want to follow along and uh, understand where we're, we're going with this and, and keep up to date with our investments, please uh, connect with me on LinkedIn. Awesome. Eric, that was killer. Thank you for running through years of work in, in just a few minutes or so. And then obviously, a, a massive vision to, to, to go forward. I have a question for you. If you... If you had to pick yes, one entity or one team in the CDM that's your favorite above all others, what, what would it be and why? Um, it, it's program management. So I, you know, I think within program management, the work that we did thinking about incorporating theory of change um, and how to build out the results framework, um, that was a lot of fun. You know, we we built this, you know, working with um, IATI TAG, um, the International Aid Transparency Initiative um, uh, Technology Group, and working with the, the data architects and information architects that were part of that steering team in thinking about how do we incorporate from an institutional donor perspective via IATI, how you want to, tr you know, the traceability of the money going all the way through the system. And from a uh, nonprofit and a program officer perspective, how do you construct a good program and understand the um, the, the outputs, the outcomes, the, the impact and measures and baselines that you need um, to incorporate the, the story from a program and then communicate it back to the funder. And connecting all of those dots allowed us to trace the, the money from donation down into the programs, into donation services, and back to reporting to, to the donors. Um, it, it, you know, was the, you could hear the puzzle piece click um, when, when we did that, that piece of work. Do you, do you think that all the collaborators got it right, you know, or mostly right. What's your confidence level in that core of that? Because we don't have gap or, uh, you know, external standards. And that's been one of the questions I've thought about as one of the many yeah. contributors is like, did, did the team get this right? And is it going to stand the test of time, at least for long enough for people to meet the promise of kind of today's discussion, which is like we, the more we can do to connect the data and the information and really most importantly, the people that do the work the better. So, so what's your, you know, if you had to put it on a scale of one to a hundred, how, how, what's your confidence on, on the rightness of that core construct? And, yeah, and I'm, uh, I'm pretty confident about it and also recognize um, everything evolves. Like we, we have the advantage when we, you know, brought together th this team, we had the advantage of going latest in, in uh, a string of um, individual organizations that, that were developing their own data models for their own um, application purposes. We got to to you know see how um, that was being implemented all around the the sector and see some of the challenges for having these data silos all around the sector and in thinking about how to build something that that would be um, you know that Rosetta Stone um, uh, what what would we need to pay attention to recognizing that you know these other models exist and that there are other standards that exist so. We did quite a bit of work to, to iterate and make sure that um, we had the right level of abstraction on, on the data entities themselves and tested on how it would be um, reflected in different kinds of organizations with different kinds of missions, um, with different technology companies, with different platforms solving uh, different scenarios. So I've got a lot of confidence that um, it will stand the test of time. I also recognize it is a le living, breathing model. Um, Microsoft, we help steward it, but it's owned by the community. And I imagine, you know, as we get through this and as it um, is in increasing use, we will get great feedback on how it can continue to, to be tuned and improved. Awesome. I'm right there with you on that, Eric. And I think, you know, 
we had the benefit of being in the room for uh, at least a reasonable number of those discussions with so many incredibly brilliant you know practitioners from all walks of life and different causal areas and I wish everybody could have heard those discussions and debates because I think yeah. it would really drive the point home that uh, that everybody's working really hard to figure out that core normalized construct while at the same time leaving plenty of room for the necessary flexibility that's that's out there so I could go on uh, with you forever, and I I, uh, I would, uh, but I want to make sure we've got time to, to get to the panel too. So, uh, speaking of contributions from the community, um, Eric, thank you for that. And we're gonna take a quick transition now to hear uh, from a couple of people who are leading a new engagement center online called the Nonprofit CDM Community with support uh, and stewardship from Microsoft. Ryan Ozimek from PicNet and Tim Milwaukee from Now it Matters are gonna join us in all future webcasts as well uh, from the community desk to share the latest. So Ryan and Tim, over to you guys. Welcome to the nonprofit Common Data Model Community Wrap-Up, where we take you around the nonprofit CDM world in two minutes and try to stay on topic. I'm Ryan Osmick. And I'm Tim Lockie. In this edition of the Community News, the nonprofit CDM community welcomed its 100th member this week. For fear of needing to hand out a prize they don't have, the identity of the winner was not announced. I'm sure the lucky community member was hoping for a big publisher clearinghouse style party, Tim. What a shame, right? Tim? Tommy Spann, the newest member of the Mission CRM team and longtime community advocate, raised this question in the Yammer community. Hey, Microsoft TSI folks, why no industry category for nonprofits? is buried under other public sector industries next to forest and fishing. We represent more than 6% of the US GDP. Surely that alone is reason to justify nonprofits as a top level industry category. Greg from Microsoft reported that it is on the backlog list from the storefront team. This news desk was impressed that Greg was polite enough not to say what all of us were thinking, which is that everyone knows that the $1.472 trillion contribution from the nonprofit sector is only 5.6 of the US GDP and not the 6% that Tommy reported. Ryan? Absolutely shocking statistics. Thanks, Tim. On March 18th, the nonprofit CDM community will host a webinar titled Advancing Impact and Equity with the nonprofit CDM. Tracy Kronzak of Now It Matters will be leading a panel of nonprofit leaders, including Amy Sample Ward of N10, Leon Wilson of the Cleveland Foundation, and Darrell Booker of Microsoft Philanthropies. This event will be virtual, even though this pandemic was only scheduled oh, for two weeks over a year ago last March. You can learn more about the event on the Nonprofit CDM website, www.nonprofitcdm.org. Tim? In our last event, an attendee asked this question. Is the goal of this contribution to expand access and knowledge of the Microsoft NCDM, or is this to move to a platform agnostic data model that Microsoft, Salesforce, Oracle, and others can all map to within their own products to make data collecting and impact measurements a common language so that nonprofits can choose their platform but contribute the data for the global goal? Arturo, the answer to this is the second thing. Ryan, back to you. Always so succinct. Thanks, Tim. Well, that's all for your NCDM community wrap up. For more great information about the community and answers to questions like, why is Tim's camera in black and white? Tune in to our 24 hour broadcast at www.nonprofitcdm.org. Actually, it's not a broadcast. It's just a website, but it's a great website. See you next time. Thanks guys, that was fun and uh, true to character for both of you. It's uh, no surprise that you've been able to develop great community efforts all around uh, these types of efforts and uh, common data model for nonprofits as well as other ecosystems. So grateful for your participation. I I'd like to welcome Suzanne and Marnie and Eric back for a discussion to, to dig into things. And Marnie, I'd love to, to start with you if that's all right. You know, we've been talking about, you know, this CDM thing and how it's gonna help 
us interoperate and improve capacity and scale impact. You have just an incredible amount of visibility to what's going on with your own personal work uh, as well as with TechSoup. What, what's your What's your take on this from where you sit? Yeah, it's super interesting. I, I was excited to hear about the idea of the unified data that, that you were talking about, Eric. And I, I was thinking a lot about the, you know, we helped at TechSoup, we, we supported getting donations of products, including Microsoft's, to roughly 270,000 organizations in 236 countries last year. So the idea that we could be helping those small grassroots organizations access those donated and discounted products to be able to use tools developed on top of a common data model is exciting, not just in the way it lowers their cost and ability to connect to technology and make decisions, but the idea that we start having a pool of unified data and we can talk about issue areas, right? Like, cause that's the other side effect of the CDM is that you start having all of these organizations collecting common data elements and we can start saying, well, what does, you know, hunger look like in, in communities around the world? And we can do it without burdening these small organizations with constant reporting, right? So for, for me, that's the, that's the promise of a tool like this and, and the ability to deliver it to these grassroots organizations that may not have a lot of resources, can't afford some of the larger commercial partnerships, and they still have an opportunity to benefit from these kinds of things. That's that's great insight, Marty. And and one of the things I didn't talk about, you know, everything around Microsoft Cloud for nonprofit. Um, there's there's a lot of operational components in there about um, how nonprofits fundraise, how you steward the, the donorship funds, how you design great programs. It's that delivery of services and how you use information um, and to to do the research to make um, better informed decisions. And and what could we do to help aggregate sources of data around common topic areas? COVID's an obvious one and, and COVID mm -hmm. has driven a lot of um, innovation and a lot of openness now around how to look at the disease morbidity, look at um, uh, uh, vaccine uh, availability, look at distribution and equitable, equ equitable distribution in uh, emerging markets. And that is now driving um, organizations, institutional um, IGOs um, and, uh, and uh, academia to think about how to collaborate and um, aggregate that data. And now what do you need in terms of uh, data sharing agreements? What do you need in terms of um, uh, you know, some of the, in the insights and templates on, on top of that? Taking that, that um, opportunity, uh, unfortunately, with COVID, right, and extending that model out and thinking now about um, sustainability, thinking about conservation, thinking about hunger, um, I'm, I'm hopeful that the collaboration that we're seeing cross-sector now with COVID will, will start to see replicated and um, repeated with some of the other um, critical need areas. Suzanne, do you think that'll play out with, with TIST and, and also, you know, historically have, have what have the biggest barriers been to adopting technology, both within the teams and potentially with participants? And has any of that changed in the last year for you and the, the you know, hundred of thousand farmers that TIST engages with? Yeah, absolutely. I think both of you, uh, I could have nodded along the entire time because that's exactly what we're dealing with as a small grassroots organization. Um, you know, you mentioned the reporting requirements. I, I think funders are now asking for more data than ever, and they're asking for how we are measuring it. And so the requirements put on these organizations is greater than ever. And so having easy ways to understand our impact and measure that against other organizations is critical so that, you know, we can be out there supporting these 100,000 farmers and, you know, working with them um, versus continuing to build bespoke systems and reporting and you not be able to reuse any of it. Yeah, it's one of the biggest challenges, isn't it, with with different donors having different reporting requirements. Um, when from a, a nonprofit perspective, you've got a program and you know an issue you're trying to solve that may have multiple donors, and you have to report differently to each one of those donors. It it creates a, a lot of overhead, a lot of noise, and often the donors don't fund that component. And you know, really, what's useful from a, a problem solving perspective is using that aggregated data and having common indicators so that you're reporting uh, efficiently and tracking um, uh, um, consistently across different donors. 
couldn't agree with you more. That's been my life for the last couple of months, filling out all of our annual reports. And so um, that is something we absolutely struggle with and, you know, would like to find a better solution to manage. Yeah. We've got a question uh, from Joff uh, who's asking for uh, some more information around the roadmap for, for cloud for nonprofits. Eric, is there a way to, to encapsulate that uh, and then also bring that back to this discussion that we're having around um, scale and impact? Yeah, so I, I talked a lot about kind of where we are today with, with Microsoft Cloud for Nonprofit. The next release is we're doing a release in April that will focus on LinkedIn Sales Navigator integration. It will include um, some uh, um, uh, workflow enhanced um, you know, privacy and security, taking advantage of everything Microsoft in, invests there, um, as well as um, customer card integration with customer insights as we convert customer insights into donor insights. Um, as we look ahead, then we're focusing on volunteer management and volunteer engagement. And so that will be then the, the next launch um, after April. We'll, we'll focus on um, volunteering and how to light up um, communities of volunteers. Going forward, um, we will continue to be um, transparent, particularly with our partners, about where we're going with Microsoft Cloud for Nonprofit. You can expect us to invest in the areas I talked about around the wheel with program delivery, with unified data, and um, a continued work around that um, constituent and donor management. There's work um, around this whole conversation that we're doing as well that you know, feeds into a Microsoft Cloud for Nonprofit as an operational tool, but also how we can use um, Microsoft and our influence and some of the partnerships that we have to help um, the conversation get started and, and get traction around some of those you know, industry data workbenches or data sharing templates or um, uh, common indicator sets. And you know, that's, those are all areas where I think we're, we're really keenly interested. You know, how can we lend some of what we do in Microsoft Philanthropies and Tech for Social Impact as a partner with nonprofits, with funders, uh, to help um, make it easier um, to access uh, aggregated data sets and, and report on results. Uh, I've got a, a question for, for Marnie and Suzanne. Um, if, let's say, I were a genie, uh, or I could grant you one wish, I'm not, but I sometimes I wish I would, and it can't be that you get an infinite number of additional wishes, which would be the answer that, that I, I would hope you would give. But if there was one wish that, that could be granted to you related to technology and program design, uh, what would it be? Marty, you can jump in first if you want to. Sure, I, I think that's a great question. I think for me, it would really be that we have um, sort of dedicated groups of developers that try to make technology use more seamless for the organizations and, and and to reduce the friction so that they can spend time doing the hard work in the field that they need to do, you know, and, and not trying to make commercial products fit their needs. And so that we're just better able to fill the gap between where commercial products leave off and, and the frontline needs of the organization start. And I, and I think things like the common data model help move us there when people really start embracing it and applying it to the technology solutions. How about you, Suzanne? Great, I'm gonna answer this question probably a bit more selfishly. Um, and Dan, I know you've heard this before, but for me, it's the seamless flow of data from the field into management tools and reports that we can help see data near real time, make decisions and become more agile as an organization. You know, the more time that we wait to see our impact, the more time we lose to make more impact. Yeah, lo love that. Love both answers. And, and Dan, you know, we've had some recent conversations around, um, you know, some of those, those tools that are in the field, like, um, like ComCare and Kobo and DHIS2 and others, like what, what's the opportunity to work with the survey tools, with the data, data tools that are being used across the sector in the field and how can those um, uh, be connected now into some of the, the research and analytics platforms? Yeah, and to be able to do that kind of once, right, in, in such a way that we don't have to build it, you don't have to build it, the teams that an ecosystem around Salesforce doesn't have to build it, et cetera, but provide those mappings using the CDM kind of is the core construct, but then allow for that um, that flexibility that these survey design tools offer. Because 
everybody's going to use them differently, but that that core information is going to flow effectively to the same entities. I know this is a core topic that's at play inside the CDM community right now too. So Suzanne, I, I hear you loud and clear once again. And for those that are listening, the, the core of this is that for, for TIS to be able to really use an app like V.World, it has to have like an automatic connection to the data collection tool sets that they use. And if it doesn't have that, and this goes back to your point, Marnie, TIS isn't going to invest in that. They have better things to do with their funds. So we have to do that, or somebody in the market has to do that, and we need to make it available. And otherwise, you know, the system's not going to be valuable to them. It's just going to be, in, you know, one more data island, which is certainly not what we're after, and it's definitely not what the spirit of the, the CDM is. So I'm um, saying it here in front of everybody, Suzanne, even though you've heard me say it before, it's coming soon. I have no doubt. Yeah. Well played, though, my friend. Well played. I like that. <laughs> Great. There, there's. Uh, we're going to take maybe, I know we're well over time, and uh, I'm happy to stay if uh, and others can stay as long as they, they, they'd like. But if it's okay with folks, we'll take a you know a couple more questions from, from uh, the folks mm -hmm. in the audience, and then we'll, we'll wrap up from there. Um, Naomi's got a question here uh, about what impact do you envision the CDM having on moving the needle on the SDG indicators? Uh, anybody can take that question. I'll jump in here a, li a little bit. I think one of the things that it, it can do is start to collect, you know, right now when we look at the SDG indicators, we mostly are looking at government or business data. And organizations help all the people that by definition aren't getting support from governments or businesses, you know, and they collect data that can help us hold businesses and governments accountable. So the ability to enhance those data sets with a true grassroots view of what's happening on the ground is tremendous. It, it may not feel like an advance at first, I suspect, in some parts of the world, but it'll give us a more complete understanding so that we can, we can see what all parts of our community are experiencing and what that, that change needs to look like. Yeah, and, and super tactically um, that the SDGs are available as an indicator set in the, the CDM model. And so if you look at, at tools like B.World that take advantage of that theory of change and the, and the program mm -hmm. design and program delivery and insights components, um, it is a, a layer on top of that. And you can you know, use your own indicator sets. You can subscribe to standard indicator sets and SDGs as a standard indicator set can be now directly tied easily to, to really any program with any organization that adopts the model. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, for the other tech providers on, uh, out there, we didn't have to figure that design out. We were able to inherit that from the CDM, incorporate it into the product, interpret it the way that we wanted to, but then have that alignment just carry through, which is a huge time saver. And, and I think, you know, testimony to how these types of initiatives can lower the barrier for our own mm -hmm. capital Products, yeah, so so if, if you had asked me what my wish was, that's my wish. My, you know, one of the, the questing beasts in, in the sector, I think, are around standard indicators. How could we align around indicators around specific areas? SDG is a, it are a great start. Um, but imagine having um, standard indicator sets that could be loaded in, and connected to something like Common Data Model that then tech sector partners like Microsoft and others could adopt into tools that um, then nonprofits can use. And together with donors that also use those same indicator sets um, really, really simplifies donor reporting. That, that's a huge dream of mine. Super complex uh, uh, problem, but let's try it. Yeah, I, I think Leona uh, Thomas, who's a friend from Philadelphia uh, and an amazing human being, if you don't know Leona, you need to meet Leona, has a question. I think it's a really important one uh, which is about, you know, most of the funding only focuses on the programs themselves and not what it takes to maintain or needed to run things. Uh, Eric, specifically to you, you know, what's Microsoft doing on this front? And then I'd love uh, if Suzanne or Marnie want to chime in about like, what are, what are, what are you hearing from and or saying to funders about the need for infrastructure investments and ongoing capacity support? Uh, that isn't, you know, purely restricted to the program delivery side of the house, but really is there to help sustain these types of investments, which which need to go through the adaptive programming cycle that your organizations are working through, especially yeah. at times like those we've seen recently. Yeah, the the most 
valuable funding you can give any nonprofit organization is unrestricted and um, allow the organization to, to use it where it most needs to be used. Um, when I was at PATH, I worked in an organization that was overwhelmingly funded by restricted grants. And um, while uh, um, it, it, uh, really targeted and, and focused and, and helps critical work get done, what it doesn't do is help the, the, all the information, all the, the insights gained within the context of that grant there typically isn't funding for how to take that information and compare it to everything that came before it and what might come after it. And um, Suzanne, to your point around, you know, donors are asking increasingly complex questions and um, uh, really data driven and asking how nonprofits are answering those questions and how they're utilizing data. Where are the grants to fund that? Um, to, to you know, get get the the insights, aggregate the data across programs, across the, those restricted grant areas. And so, from a Microsoft perspective, we do a couple things. One is um, from from a software and services uh, perspective, we try to make um, as much available as possible um, for free to nonprofits so that they can adopt digital technology. And um, uh, what isn't free, we have um, amazing discounts uh, across the, the whole product set. So how, and then combine that with all the capacity building um, in digital enablement, digital transformation, skills, training, together with partners like TechSoup um, to, to provide the most services we can to the smallest nonprofits that don't have the funding to spend on themselves. Um, and uh, hopefully in that way, make it easier for, for organizations to at least have the, the tools and capabilities to use those tools. We also use um, our voice to talk about the importance of uh, uh, of this problem, and in thinking about um, measuring nonprofits based on their impact, not on their overhead rate, and using overhead rate as a proxy for nonprofit efficacy has been a problem in the sector for decades, and it's it's a race to the bottom. And I don't know about you guys, but I don't you know when I'm looking at my own retirement funds, I don't you know, invest money in organizations that are only investing, you know, one to 3% themselves um, and R&D and how to improve and be better organizations. I'm looking for organizations that are innovating, that are, um, you know, thinking ahead, um, also about efficiency and also about what, what they're delivering. But we don't ask that of nonprofit organizations. We, we think it's most efficient to drive all the money possible um, into the mission um, that, that you know, really puts blinders on organizations. And, and while in the context of a specific tactical engagement on, on a, a mission task, you have the funding to do it and operate, and that's fantastic. What it doesn't do is allow the organization to, to maybe um, rise up and, and use data strategically and, and think about mm -hmm. how it could most effectively operationalize itself and innovate itself and use data more strategically and, and make those kinds of investments. And so we use our voice to, to help tell that story as well. Mm -hmm. Suzanne, any reaction to that from where you sit? Yeah, I, I mean, this hits to a core of a lot of problems that we face at TIST. The, the idea that, you know, it's okay that we're running off of a 2012 database that needs some serious upgrading. And it is still a hard conversation to have to explain the importance of why we need to invest in those, even though it does, you know, in the short term take away from potentially uh, what we give back to the farmers. But I do think, um, you know, Microsoft has made it pretty easy to start somewhere. I, I will say on top of our 2012 database had our 2012 email server that we self managed and me without very much of a tech background was able to migrate us over into, you know, Microsoft 365 and email and prevent, you know, or help us stay protected from attacks and you know looking at those small wins are really big wins in the scheme of things yeah. because it's easy to use and we can continue to add on piece by piece we don't have to do everything at once awesome there's a, a great question in here from sammy which i, I want to take a really short reaction to because i think we're we're maybe an example of how we'd love to see other people play this out but it's it's about engagement strategy for emerging markets in africa regarding cloud for nonprofits and we have a one of our team members is alex uh robinson alexander robinson and, and a vision that she has for how we develop technology is to try to incorporate 
the local context and the experts in the field in that area that know the people into the use of the application through means like video, through developing community in a local context, of course, respecting data privacy and ethics, um, but and allowing for that on an opt-in basis. Uh, but our intent is to leverage the CDM as the core construct for that so that you have transference from one organization to another. Imagine, you know, if you're running a project or a program using a tool like B.World in a small rural area in a particular country in a place like Africa, there are people there who know far more than anyone in our team will ever know about the true reality of what it's like to try to make progress there in, in whatever light. And so part of our strategy is to actually create the technology in such a way that it can be completely changed at the local level and that the real life humans that actually know what's going on in that context, whether it's like down the street in Philadelphia, which I also don't know anything about, uh, or you know, all the way halfway around the world in some specific place, uh, is uh, is gonna you know gonna be the way to go about it. But uh, I don't know if Eric or Marnie, um, you know, from your perspective on on from the enablement side, what yeah. strategies that you you all have? Yeah, it, it's a huge topic for us, and and we have a, a specific investment within Microsoft Philanthropies around emerging market and and what we can do with clients, with partners, with nonprofits that are um, operating um, and local um, to the global south. Um, I. Uh, I'll also say, so from a tech for a social impact perspective, we're we're so committed to this that you know as we think about capacity building and how we we make our nonprofit partners successful using technology, we started a, a client success team. We started that team in Nairobi, and and so it's it's based out of Nairobi, and we're providing um, you know services first to organizations that are um, uh, have the most need and and ha you know have the most. Uh, um, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, technology mission connection. Marty, does does the topic of you know accessibility to technology in in uh, in Africa specifically come into yeah. play? Yeah, TechSoup's an enormous partner for us in in that emerging market strategy. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, and and that's that's courtesy of the TechSoup Global Network, of course, because we're working with organizations on the ground and. You know, Kenya, West Africa, S South Africa, but also from the perspective of the global South, you know, in, in Colombia and, and Brazil, and 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 that's the that's the part of localizing the context so that they get tra training in the way that meets the needs of the community, and doesn't just meet the needs of the technology or the product, right? And that the connective tissue that those those organizations can provide because it is their community is I think vital to, to part of what's required for people to be able to embrace and take it on. Suzanne, you, yeah. I imagine you have some thoughts on this as well. I mean, we live and breathe this every day. Uh, the majority of our farmers are in East Africa and you know, that's the conversation we're constantly having. How do we, you know, get them the tools that they need with the limitations that they have, no service, um, you know, no smartphones, and how do we continue to upskill them? Um, and that's a really hard question, and it's something that we'll continue to iterate and, you know, make improvements where we can. Wonderful. Uh, well, I think we've blown the clock uh, way out of the water, so we better better move on and start to wrap things up. But uh, team, I, I thank you so much for the time. Uh, you've you've made my week, you've made my month, and and made this Friday wonderful, wonderful for me personally. I, ho I hope that uh, the people that were able to participate in the audience had a great time and were able to take something away from this and uh, about us as individuals and our co individual commitments to this work, but also where where we hope to go and how much work lies ahead. Um, thanks to Aaron from the Redmond desk and Ryan and Tim from the community desk for jumping in. A uh, quick reminder that the next webcast is going to be on May 25th. We're going to talk about participant-centered case management uh, and how it's made possible in the common data model for nonprofits. So uh, completely different run of show for that. Uh, and also uh, stay tuned for the public launch of B.World on April 7th. Uh, this show was produced by our creative director, John Wise, with support from our operations lead, Maureen Kearns. Thank you to both of you for making it happen. That's it for today, folks. Uh, stay safe and healthy. 
and take good care of one another. Thanks for sharing this time with us. I hope you have a great weekend uh, and just an uh, outpouring of gratitude from all of us. You're, you are wonderful. So take care, everybody. Bye now. Thank you. Thanks.